Hi, my name is Bonnie Youngs and I'm here to talk to you about interaction in blended learning. So in order to start, let's talk about interaction in general. So interaction in our first language looks like what? Well, we talk to multiple people in multiple places, at the dinner table, at the grocery store, when we're in a meeting with our pets, while having coffee. And obviously this is not what interaction in our second language looks like. So what happens when you're a student of an L2? Think back, was your first attempt at communicating successful? Did you communicate your ideas or your thoughts or your needs successfully? Did you want to try again and again and were you nervous? Chances are that your very first attempt was not entirely successful, that you were nervous and that you wanted to keep practicing. So the question then is where do L2 learners practice their languages? And what you see on the screen are many, many different places and many, many different options for them. They can do experiential learning with people who speak their L2. They can spend time abroad. They can use social media. They can be online with friends uh, or in a video game, for example. They can use technology. They can obviously be in the classroom and we can talk about blended learning. But the thing to consider here is that often our L2 learners, they interact with strangers if they are outside of their language classroom. So then we can talk about what is blended learning. So sometimes blended learning is called hybrid learning. And what that means is that there is a portion of time where the students uh, interact with an instructor and perhaps classmates in real time. The rest of the time they're in their online course and they are learning the course content. So what you have on the screen are three different explanations or descriptions and it is formal education. The students do use online content and the student has some control over where and when. So, for example, at the university, my students have been known to do their online homework at 3 a.m. It's not what we advise, but they do it when they can do it. Um, we also have the opportunities to give our students different modalities so they can do listening comprehension, they can practice speaking, they can do reading, they can do different types of activities. And what happens is that there has to be a place where students are supervised and often there is maybe one class per week in a blended learning environment that one class is where the student the students and the teachers get together and they use their l2 so what i'd like to do is tell you now briefly about the types of interaction that we'll be looking at we have learner learner interaction learner-teacher interaction, learner-tutor interaction, learner-content interaction, learner interaction with communities of practice using technology as a mediating tool. So if you've heard the expression CMC, for example, computer-mediated communication, that would be perhaps within a larger community of practice. And then the last one is learner-technology interaction. So we're going to play the board game and we'll start with learner learner. So a learner in a blended environment has multiple advantages. There is autonomy, as we've already noted. It can be asynchronic, asynchronic or synchronic. So asynchronic meaning I can do my work while um, when I need to, whereas someone else, your classmates, can do their work when they need to. And only when we come together as a class is our work synchronic. A student can develop their own motivation, their own focus, their own engagement. And this is very important, as I've heard from my university students, is that their strategy develops actually over time for how they engage themselves, how they motivate themselves, and what they do in order to focus with their online learning. And this is really important because it does, I have seen, it does uh, transfer into their regular traditional classroom contexts.
And of course, a learner who wouldn't normally have access to an Arabic class, for example, could take an online Arabic class and thus have access to that new content. The other affordances are that the students can actually go online, they can meet with each other, they can challenge other people's viewpoints, they can uh, build on their, other, um, on their ideas, on others' ideas, and they can achieve a skill for communication and collaboration that maybe they wouldn't have other, otherwise had the opportunity to do. And as we know, in today's business world, there are multiple opportunities for online interactions and synchronic and asynchronic interactions. So our next step on the board is the learner-teacher interaction. On the right-hand side, you have non-traditional classroom options. So for example, you have a rotational option and students rotate through different modes of learning and at least one of these modes of learning is online or digital. So there could be a classroom option, uh, uh, the online, there could be a, a project gathering for students, there could be a tutor, uh, uh, a tutor meeting for students in order to clear up any uh, difficulties they're having. The flex, the next one over, Students do most of their work online, but they are still under te teacher supervision. Uh, there just aren't as many options as in the rotational option. A la carte, on the bottom, students do their learning entirely online with an online instructor. And we'll see what this looks like uh, in a few minutes. And then enriched virtual, students receive one-on-one -on -one sessions with their instructor, and then they do the rest of their coursework independently and we've seen this in some online schools for example in Pennsylvania we have the charter school option which is uh, entirely online. So what can the learner get from this learner teacher interaction? So what we can do is we can offer varying approaches to teaching uh, both for the teacher and the learner but what we're doing is we're encouraging the students to take some ownership of their of their learning and the teacher literally becomes the guide on the side because he or she is not front and center all of the time in the classroom. We are connecting students with the world. We are teaching them, as I said, collaboration and communication skills. We know that typing something, replying to an email, replying to a text is not the same as doing it in voice and in face. And we have to be careful with the way that we reply. Um, electronically. And we can allow the students to develop innovative projects, um, which can get them again connected with other people in the world, but also with other problems um, in the world. Our next step is the learner-tutor interaction. So on the left you see that, as I said, the teacher takes the role as a facilitator and a mentor, helps to move the students through the learning process, through the content. On the right-hand side, the students are responsible for their own outcomes because we're putting more of the onus on them to pay attention to how they're learning and to how they are uh, teaching themselves to learn. In the center, sometimes in online courses, we have the option of a tutor. And the tutor is the person who guides the students and supports them through the learning process. Now, this is not to say that the teacher does not have that role also, but a tutor can be, for example, a peer tutor, maybe a student who's more advanced than the student who's learning. And this can help students feel more comfortable because they are with someone who's about their age and who has already been through the process of learning this material. Um, tutors sometimes have um, the opportunity to assess students' contributions, and that can be a decision that's left up to the teacher, whether or not they want that to happen. Uh, but uh, for the most part, tutors can do some assessment because they can take a role in the discussions and they can help lead the students. And in that way, you can see who is more or less prepared as we've all seen in our own work. The next path is interaction learner with their content. So obviously an online course is no good if the content is no good. 
And of course, student interest and uh, student engagement with the content is important. But how do we help students become engaged in the content? Well, we have to pay attention to the best practices for designing online and blended learning environments. And we need high quality instructional content. I would also advise that when choosing either software or some type of an application that you have the opportunity to change or to correct something that you find is either not appropriate or just completely out in left field. It's not something you would ever teach to your students. You need to give students the time to give priority to the course materials and you have to understand that course materials for students mean that's how i earn my grade and so if the students don't have quality course materials if they don't have a good control over the materials through the technology then they're going to feel that that is going to badly affect their grade and that is sometimes what we see when students actually end up dropping courses. And of course, content must be relevant to them, it must be useful to them, and we all have had experience and challenges with making our classes um, both relevant and useful to our students. But these are the points that we want to focus on for content. Next, we're going to look at learners um, interacting with their communities of practice. So right here, we have the basic. In the middle, communities of practice with technology as a medi mediating tool means that people are connected with tools. People are connected through technology. And so what does this mean? It means that we have, on the right of your screen, targeted content. We have specific things that we wanna talk about with the people online with us. We are sharing information with the people who are online with us. And of course, the tools have to be tools that are going to allow whatever type of sharing. Is it screen sharing? Is it text sharing? Is it listening or speaking sharing? These tools have to be adequate and, and up to standard so that our students can be successful. Um, we also feel that a learner who is spending less time memorizing and more time practicing actually helps develop those communities of practice. So, so what then is a community of practice? If you look on the bottom left of the screen, you're looking at authentic or quasi-authentic contexts that are created for students and in which they do the knowledge that is required and they work toward a learning goal. So it's not memorizing past tense, it's not memorizing a series of vocabulary words. What it is is a community of practice when all of these people, whether they're two or whether they're 50, online, and we are all at vacation. What did it look like? Who did we go with? Where did we go? What did we do? And if you find that you are interested then in somebody else's experience in a vacation, then you can direct your questions to that person. But what's happening is, is that we all have a common goal and we're using the technology as that tool in order to connect with each other. So our last type of interaction is a learner with the technology. Now, now this is kind of difficult to, to research because when you look up interaction learner technology, what happens is you end up with the learner-learner interaction or you end up with the learner-teacher interaction or you end up with learner communities of practice. So when we think about the technology, we actually have to think about the tool itself. And so you have three items here that can help us think about the technology and how the learner deals with the technology. Uh, I know I'm saying the word technology a lot, but that's what we want to focus on here. So the clarity of design, how the students interact with instructors, and how there is active discussion among course participants. What this says is that the tool has to be clear. 
the tool has to be able to work for whatever I need it to, for whatever I'm assigned to do as a student. Um, it has to be easy for me to interact with my instructors. It has to be easy for me to find the button where I click to open an active discussion with my, the other people in my course. Under number two, you see again this ease of navigation and we have a sense of human interaction. Um, more and more since HyperCard, for those of you who remember HyperCard, HyperCard wasn't exactly human. There wasn't a lot of how are you or there wasn't an option to look something up just by using your voice. And so when you choose software or when you choose a technology tool, uh, these are some of the things that we have to consider. And in the third item, we always want positive learner action, le learner interaction, pardon me, with the technology, and we want effective interaction between the learner and the technology. And so what does this mean? So we talked about content briefly, and we're looking at scaffolding of content. It's not merely uh, you've seen students present where every single word they want to say to the audience is on one screen, right? It's on one slide for all of, uh, all of the audience to see. And it's almost like the student doesn't even need to be there in order to make the presentation. Can do technology that presents content in a positive way is going to scaffold that content just like you would do if you were teaching students in a traditional classroom. We want to continue through the navigation, through the interface, uh, to allow the technology to get the student into this community of practice easily. It can't be too difficult, again, for me to sign on to talk to whomever it is that I need to talk to. And the technology has to be reliable. And one of the most important things that students have found that encourages their use of the technology in order to learn online is timely feedback. So we know we can get immediate feedback from for exercises when students are online, for example. Um, I click, I'm told whether or not it's right or wrong. But there is also the feedback that needs to come from the instructor. And what students have found is that if you don't hear from the instructor within a certain period of time, then the student really can't move forward in the work that they're doing. So if I have a serious question about the fall of Rome, um, then if I don't have that answer, either I have to go look it up on myself, in which case I'm asking, well, why do I have you? the teacher, why do I have this course? Or I understand that within 24 hours, for example, the teacher will get back to me and I'll have an answer to my question, or at least we can dialogue about what some of my problems might be. So to finish, we're on step nine. This is a list of the resources that I have used uh, in this particular presentation. Um, really, you want to go to the most dependable places. You want to go to places like flagships. You want to go to maybe teaching centers at universities uh, who use online uh, teaching a lot. You want to maybe find a conference where you can be uh, with people of like mind who also have had experiences and are willing to share them. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope to see you online at some point soon. Thank you very much.